Scripture today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Today I'm reading from the message. It is a paraphrase of Scripture, so listen for God to speak. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself, after all. I've spent a long time in sin's prison. But what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly re rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. This is the word of God. Amen. So there's a common aphorism, a proverb of sorts that goes like this. I'm sure you've heard it before. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Now, I don't believe in a literal hell, not at least the kind of hell that most people think of in the terms of the afterlife. Hell on earth, sure, we can talk about that, but a literal hell, not so much. And still, there's lots of truth to this proverb. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Now, maybe you could prove me wrong, but I'm pretty sure that I have more good intentions than any other human being on this planet, ever. There will be no one before me or after me that has any more good intentions or wants to do better than me. Again, we can, we can argue about that. Maybe, maybe you could hold a candle, but Good ideas, visions for a better world, a better nation, a better Los Angeles, a better community right here around this church. I dare you to dream about such things as much as I do. I dare you to have as, as many good intentions as I do. My dreams and my visions are numerous, and dare I say, they are all excellent. My follow-through, eh, not so much. Which is where and why the Apostle Paul and I get close real fast. I read the paraphrased scripture to you, so you may have missed the more literal, the more familiar translation. It goes like this. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Now there's a preacher speaking my language. And I could use a good preacher these days. It's been a rough week for me, for many of us really. 
I have to admit my faith in the world is a little shaken these days. Maybe my faith in God is shaken a little bit too. Sometimes it's hard, you know, to separate the two. I want the world to be a certain way, and at least in my own heart, in my own mind, the way God wants the world is the way that I want the world. I think most faithful people operate this way. We want what we believe God wants, and we trust that God will help us get there. Not do it for us, but help us get there. And if this is true, if I'm anywhere close to wanting the world to be the way that God wants it, then several events these past days have us both being pretty disappointed, maybe even a little bit mad. Five men in our Supreme Court decided that a corporation should have the same religious rights as you and me. And in doing so, five men decided against the equal rights of women and for a company that calls itself Christian. Though, let's be honest, they're only Christian when it's convenient to them and according to their own very narrow definition of being a part of the Christian church. If God and I are close to being on the same page, then this past week has given us plenty to grieve about. Three Israeli boys were kidnapped, brutally murdered in the West Bank. Cause enough for mourning and much sorrow for sure. Yet without pause for any due process or transparent investigation, the Israeli government leapt into action. Firing first, asking questions later using their superior and made-in-the-USA weapons, mind you, they have bombed and wreaked havoc throughout Palestine in the days since, punishing anyone they remotely suspected in this heinous crime. Retribution is not the same thing as justice. And these actions from a place of righteous indignation, they only further the divide of God's children closer to home. Hundreds of residents in and around the town of Murrieta, all white, at least all of them that I've seen on the television or in the newspaper, all white and all people who have conveniently forgotten that they too were once immigrants. Hundreds of people have protested and blocked and turned away buses of children bound for the immigrant detention center in their town. Refugees of dire poverty and violence from various Central American countries, most of which is funded by our own drug money, mind you. These children journeyed through Mexico, many of them unaccompanied and on their own, all to find a better life in the United States. And despite the perils and extraordinary danger, these children were sent because it was their best hope. The only chance their parents could provide for a good life. I'm disheartened. I'm especially sad and angry and frustrated, disappointed. Equality, compassion, and love have all suffered so horribly in each of these events. And I'm left wondering who to trust. Who can we turn to? Politicians? We, the people? Federal law, international law, religious law? How about me, myself, and I? Without trust in someone, hope is awfully hard to come by, after all. So in whom shall I trust? In whom shall we trust? I know one thing for sure. I don't seem to trust myself very much. Like Paul, I acknowledge that I don't do the things I want to do, but I do the very things I don't want to do. Most of the time, instead of actively doing evil or bad, this just means I do nothing at all, which itself is a terrible thing. 
There is a quote that haunts me. It's from Nobel Peace Prize winner and Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel. And he says, the opposite of love is not hate. It is indifference. Oddly, I love that quote enough not to be indifferent to it. It isn't so much that we're choosing to support or participate in the bad, but it is, I think, related to feelings of helplessness. Indifference is a result of helplessness. The common refrain is, I want to make a difference, but the problem is so big and so complex, I don't even know where to start. And the best advice Paul has for us and that I can give to you is to try and try and try again. And in the end, when you think, I'm not going to try anymore, I'm tired of failing, trust in God for the rest. Paul, it seems to me, understands this inner turmoil of indifference. But Paul isn't excusing inaction, not for himself, not for you or for me. No excuses. You know the good that needs to be done, so keep trying. Don't worry about your inaction. The mercy of God in Jesus Christ is beyond what any of us can imagine. So what are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? Get back to trying with the full trust in Christ. This letter to the church in Rome is Paul's last letter. Though he did not intend for it to be, Romans is Paul's final dissertation. Whereas earlier letters seemed to explore and develop his theology, Romans, more than anywhere else, nails Paul's thesis to the wall for all the world to see. And that thesis is this. Trust in the religious laws of the past, and maybe one day you will believe in yourself. Trust in what Christ has done once and for all, forever and ever, amen. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Trust in what Christ has done, and one day you will surrender to the fullness of faith in life promised in Christ Jesus. For Paul, there is no middle ground. Trust yourself or trust in Christ. One way will cause you to turn away from God. The other way makes you utterly dependent. I'm excited about this wine into water fundraiser next Sunday. You heard a little bit about that already. Maybe it's not much, but it's something. Maybe clean water isn't the most important or pressing matter for our world. Maybe it is. One thing is for sure. Clean water can change the lives of an entire community for generations to come. And really, in the end, it isn't all that difficult for us to provide it. At least it's not difficult if you and I join together and do a little bit of organizing, if we join together and make a couple of sacrifices, and if we join together and participate and get involved. The folks planning this have tried to give you all the reasons you need to come and to bring a few friends. All you have to do is buy a few tickets. Be supportive, come and enjoy and be a part of it. Do what you can do, in other words. The world needs you. The world needs me. That's hard to imagine, but it's true. No matter your big ideas or mine, no matter our dreams for the world, no matter our hit and miss follow through, we are important to God's efforts. We help God make humanity all that it can possibly be. You are important. I am important too. So do what you can do and encourage me and everyone else to do the same. But don't trust in yourself to make it all happen. And for heaven's sake, don't sit around and think that somebody else is going to do it for you. God is at work 
are trying to work inside all of us, attempting to transform us from the inside out. Some of us are broken enough, vulnerable enough, brave enough to surrender and to let this transformation happen. Some of us aren't there yet. Some of us will never give up on ourselves long enough to really trust in God. So you worry about where you are on that journey. Let God worry about the rest. That's what Paul would say. We've got work to do, and oddly enough, it can only begin when we trust in God fully, totally, forsaking any trust in our own ability to be successful. Shortly, we'll come forward to receive communion. It's just a piece of bread and a little cup of grape juice, and still, it is so very much more. No matter where you're placing your trust these days, no matter how close or how far you're feeling from God, no matter your indifference or the countless ways you do not understand your own actions, at this table, everyone is welcome. Christ makes it so and makes a radically inclusive invitation to come, receive, trust, and taste and know that God is so very, very good. Amen.